Hello, hello, hello. This is Beverly Fells Jones, the Silver Fox of Consciousness, and I am so happy that you are here joining me today. On this show, I talk about how to expand your world of thought, explore the world of positive thinking, law of attraction, and consciousness from many points of view. I truly believe you have been given the power of the word and thought to create the life you desire. If you're new to this channel, thank you for being here. If you are a subscriber, thank you too for being here. I appreciate your listening. If you're new, please subscribe. As you listen, if you like this, please hit the like button and please share your thoughts in some comments below. I always want to hear if what I have talked to you about is something that can help you make changes in your life. Today is the very last chapter in Florence Scovel Shin's book, The Power of the Spoken Word. And it's a very strong title. It's called Victory and Fulfillment. Now, have there been times when you've experienced some joy, something that's happened to you that you said, fantastic, wonderful, we have been victorious, or this was truly meaningful for me, and I have been fulfilled. So let's see what Florence is having to say in this chapter. Victory and fulfillment are the two wonderful words. And since we realize that words and thoughts are a form of radioactivity, we carefully choose the words we wish to see crystallized. Life is a crossword puzzle. The right word gives you the answer. Many people are rattling off destructive words in their conversations. We hear them say. Now, check yourself if you use any of these terms. Because you are speaking them into your life. So, here's what she says. We hear them say, I'm broke. I'm six. Remember, by your words, you are justified, and by your words, are, you are condemned. You are condemned by them because they do not return void. Change your words, and you change your world. For your world, word is your world. I like to call things my personal universe. And what do you call when you're talking to yourself or the world around you or when you look around you and, and see what condition you are in? Just claim it as your personal universe. Nobody hears you thinking. You are the one that thinks. You're the one that says the words. So be careful what comes out of your mouth. She continues, you choose your food and the world is now calorie conscious. People no longer eat but wheat cakes, beef steak, potatoes, pie, and three cups of coffee for breakfast. <laughs> did anybody ever do that? Well, farmers did anyway. To keep down weight, they eat dry toast and orange juice. This is tremendous discipline, but they are working for results. Why not try a diet of the right words? For you are literally eating your words. That is the value of affirmation. You are deliberately building up a constructive idea in your consciousness. Your consciousness may be crammed and jammed with destructive ideas, but continually making a statement of truth will dissolve these negative forms. 
These thought forms have been built up from your own vain imaginings. Perhaps as a child, you were taught that life was hard, happiness fleeting, and that the world was cold and unfriendly. These ideas are impressed upon your consciousness, and you found things just as they were predicted. With the knowledge of truth, all these external pictures may be changed, for they are only pictures, which change as your subconscious beliefs change. When I tell people about the power of the word, and that words and thoughts are a form of radioactivity, and do not return void, they say, Oh, is it as easy as that? Many people like things difficult and hard to understand. I believe that was the reason the amazingly simple teachings of Jesus Christ were forgotten after a few hundred years. People build up creeds and ceremonies which they only half understand. Now, in this 20th century, the secret things are being revealed and we are again having primitive Christianity. Ask believing thy shalt receive. We know that our beliefs are or expectancies are impressed upon the subconscious and carried out. We might say if you ask not believing, you will not receive. Faith creates expectancy. This brings to mind the story of, you know, Christ said, you say to the mountain, you know, fall down or disintegrate or whatever, and it will fall down. Remember, in the scriptures, it talks about he wanted this particular, the fruit from this particular tree, but it didn't have any fruit, so he cursed it, as a matter of fact, and it withered and died. So, what do you say? The woman said, okay, mountain, I want you to move. Right, I expect you to move. I expect that little top to, to slide down by in the morning. And she got up. The next morning, she looked up and the mountain hadn't moved. And she says, I knew it wouldn't work. If you don't believe, you won't receive. But what you do re believe, you will receive. So if you didn't believe the mountain would move, it's not going to move, even though you told it to. If you're looking for, uh, let's say, somebody to buy you a cup of coffee or give you a cup of coffee, but you don't believe it's possible that somebody might come walk up to you and give you a cup of coffee, it won't happen. I remember reading about a, 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 a seminar where the seminar leader was talking this stuff and the, the girl was having a hard time believing it he said okay he said all of you out here if you believe just ask for what you want ask for a cup of coffee ask for a cup of coffee that it's simple right and just think about getting a cup of coffee we don't know how you'll get the cup of coffee, but just think about getting a cup of coffee without you buying it. So after lunch, a group of folks were there, and this guy walked up to the girl and said, here's a cup of coffee, and I believe you like it with cream and sugar, so it's already made up, and gave it to her. She was flabbergasted. She didn't tell anybody that that was what she was going to ask him because technically he said whatever you want. You know, a sandwich or somebody to say hello or somebody to say certain words to you, whatever you want it to be. She chose the cup of coffee. Let me back it up there a little bit. And this person, out of the group of people there, brought her a cup of coffee. She became a believer. Try that. 
Try asking for something very simple in your life. Something that can be easily believed in. Easily thought of. You know, ask to be shown something. Or for me, I ask, where did I put my purse? <laughs> and it will come to me. In fact, I train my brain that it now gives me a picture of where it is. So ask, believing, thou shalt receive. Faith creates expectancy. Going on. This infinite intelligence upon which man draws his supply is called by Jesus Christ, your heavenly Father, the Father within. He described as a kind, loving parent, desirous of pouring all good things upon his children. Fear not, little flock. Tis your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He taught that God's law was simply a law of love and goodwill. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would be done by. <laughs> That's a little difficult to tongue twister there. Any violation of the law of love causes a short circuit. The way of the transgressor is hard. God is immutable law. I am the Lord law. I change not. Divine ideas are immutable. And that's I-M-M-U-T-A-B-L-E in case you want to look it up. Not subject to change. What wonderful words. Immutable. Not subject to change. A woman came to me filled with fears and forebodings. She said for years she had been pursued by the fear that even if she should receive the desire of her heart, something would happen to spoil it. I gave her the statement. The divine plan of your life is a perfect idea in divine mind, incorruptible and indestructible, and cannot be spoiled in any way. Now I know that that's a long statement, right? Very simple. The plan of your life is a perfect plan. It's a perfect plan from the divine mind, and nothing can mess it up. <laughs> that's my that's my shortened version of that. A great load was lifted from her consciousness. For the first time in years, she had a feeling of joy and freedom. Know the truth, and the truth gives you a sense of freedom. Soon then comes the actual freedom on the external. This supreme intelligence is what man becomes one with when he speaks the word. This supreme intelligence awaits man's direction, but it must have a right of way. It must not be limited. Divine activity in your body brings health. There is only one disease, congestion, and one cure, circulation. Congestion and stagnation are the same thing. People say, they have got into a rut. A new idea will take them out of the rut. We must get out of the rut of negative thinking. The word enthusiasm in the dictionary is defined to be inspired or possessed by a god. Enthusiasm is a divine fire and kindles enthusiasm in others. To be a good salesman, you must be enthusiastic about the articles you are selling. If you are bored with your business or uninterested, the fires go out. No one else will be interested. A woman came to me for success in business. She said, I have a shop, but it is usually empty. I do not bother to open it until late in the day. What's the use? I replied, there is indeed no use so long as you feel the way you do. You are keeping people away. Become enthusiastic over what you have to sell. Be enthusiastic about yourself. 
be enthusiastic about the God power within you and get up early to open your shop and be ready for the big crowd. By this time, she was all wound up with divine expectancy. She dashed down to her shop as early as possible, and people were waiting outside and poured in all day. Hmm. Could it be that she was opening late and it turned people away? I don't know. Think about that. People often say to me, treat my business I say, no, I will treat you, for you are your business. Your quality of thought penetrates every article for sale and all the conditions connected with it. Jesus Christ was divinely enthusiastic about the message he had to bring to the Father within each man. He was enthusiastic about faith. He told the people that whatsoever they ask in his name would be given them. It was a message of asking and receiving. He told them just how to comply with spiritual law. Ask, believing, thou shalt receive. When ye pray, believe ye have it. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? After two thousand years, His divine fire is rekindled in the consciousness of all truth. Students, we are having a Christian renaissance, a new birth, a revival of Christianity. He taught a universal principle without creed or ceremony. We see members of all religions, denominations coming into this truth movement. It does not take them away from their churches. In fact, many clergymen are now teaching what the metaphysicians are teaching. For Jesus Christ is the greatest of all metaphysicians because he proved his principles and brought miracles to pass. He sent forth his disciples to preach the gospel and heal the sea sick. For about 300 years, his message survived. Then his divine fire was lost, and the words, Be thou healed, were no longer spoken. Creed and ceremony took their place. Now we see people flocking to these truth centers to be healed, blessed, and prospered. They have learned to pray aright and have understanding faith. A woman told me of an answered prayer. Her son wrote her that he was going to Southern California on a business trip in his car. She read in the morning paper of a flood, and she immediately spoke the word for divine protection. She had a great feeling of security. She knew he would be protected. She soon heard from him, saying some business had interfered with his leaving, so he was detained. If he had left when he had expected, he would have been in the flood district. We become divinely enthusiastic about our answered prayers, which we call demonstrations, for it means that we have demonstrated the truth and have been set free from some limitation. Down in the comments, please tell me of a demonstration that you have had of speaking your truth, for being in the truth, and believing and receiving. I'd love to hear your story. And you can type as much as you want, but I'd love to hear, did you get a cup of coffee? Did you find that item that you were looking for? Did you get that job? Did somebody call you that you've been wanting to talk to? Whatever it is, and, and those are just examples. The, the, the demonstrations are infinite. The 24th Psalm is one of the most enthusiastic of the many psalms of praise and thanksgiving. 
Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. I remember singing that that psalm in church. Have you? The gates and doors symbolizes man's consciousness. As you are lifted up in consciousness, you contact the superconscious, the God within. The King of Glory comes in. This King of Glory lifts your burdens and fights your battles, solves your problems. The average person has a difficult time letting the King of Glory come in. Doubt, fear, and apprehension keep the doors and gates locked against your good. A student told me of a situation which she attracted by negative thinking. She had been invited to a gathering of old and valued friends. It was of the utmost importance for her to be there. She was so anxious to go. She said to herself repeatedly, Oh, I hope nothing happens to interfere. The day of the reception arrived and she woke with a terrific headache. At one time she had been subject to these headaches, going to bed for several days, but she had not had one for many years. Her doubts and fears had attracted this disappointment. She called me up and said, Will you please, (laughs) will you please speak the word that I will be well by evening to go to the reception? I replied, Why, of course, nothing can interfere with God's perfect plan. So I spoke the word. Later she told me of her miracle. She said in spite of the way she felt, she prepared to go. She cleaned her jewelry, got her dress ready to wear, and attended to every detail, though she felt scarcely able to move. Very late in the afternoon, she said she had a peculiar sensation as of a fog lifting in her consciousness, and she was perfectly well. She went to the reception and had a wonderful time. I believe that the healing might have come more quickly had she not said, I want to be well by tonight. We are continually, listen to this, we are continually limiting limiting ourselves by our words. So not until night was she perfectly well. By your word, you are justified. And by your word, you are condemned. Do not limit your good. Do not say how what you want shows up in your life. Do not do that. Just ask for it and let it just appear in all kinds of miraculous ways. I knew a man who was the center of attraction wherever he went because he was always enthusiastic about something. Whether it was about shoes, clothes, or a haircut, He enthused others into buying the same things. He did not gain anything material by it. He was just naturally enthusiastic. Someone has said, if you want to be interesting to others, be interested in something. An interested person is an enthusiastic person. We often hear people say, do tell me what you're interested in. Many people are without vital interests and are hungry to hear what other people are doing. They are usually the ones who keep the radio turned on from early morning to late at night. They must be entertained every minute. Their own affairs do not hold enough interest. A woman once said to me, I love other people's affairs. She lived on gossip. Her conversation consisted of, I was told, I was given to understand, or I heard. It is needless to say she is now paying her karmic debt. A great unhappiness has overtaken her and everyone knows about her affairs. It is dangerous to neglect your own affairs and to take an idle curiosity in what others are doing. 
We should all be busily engaged in perfecting ourselves, but take a kindly interest in others. Make the most of your disappointments by transmuting them into happy surprises. Transmute all failure, all failure into success. Transmute all unforgiveness into forgiveness, all injustice into justice. You will be kept busy enough perfecting your own life. You won't have time to run other people's affairs. Jesus Christ aroused the enthusiasm of the multitudes by performing miracles, healing the sick, and raising the dead. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did for them that were diseased. As we read this, we feel the enthusiasm of the multitudes which surrounded him. With him, all things were possible, for he knew that he and the Father were indeed one. With divine enthusiasm, I bless what I have and look with wonder at their increase. Bless the things that are in your life. Bless the things that are coming into your life. And as she said, don't be getting in other people's business. Take care of your own business. Don't worry about the people next door or down the street or the people at work or the gossip. Don't worry about that. You take care of you. You want victory in the things that you desire. You want to feel the fulfillment of being happy and having the things that you want within your life. This is the last chapter in that book. And so we're going to start with the new person. And I think the new person's going to be Catherine Ponder. And we're going to see what she has to say on a number of things coming up. So. This is Beverly Fells Jones, the Silver Fox of Consciousness. Don't forget, subscribe, hit that bell, comment, hit that like button. I appreciate all the time that you spend listening to me read to you from some of the most wonderful thought leaders of the earliest 20th century. So as you have believed, remember that, as you have believed, let it be done to you, and it is so, and I will see you in the next video.